We're just waiting for the cameras. Thanks. Start again. Good evening. And thank you very much for coming, particularly on a rather soggy evening. And an England game, I gather, is taking place tonight, which might explain why there aren't as many as I'd hoped to be here. Um, I'm Councillor Joanna Biddulph and Chairman of the Area Forum this year. Um, I'm glad to say that this Area Forum is being filmed. Um, it's not being live webcast, whatever the live broadcast, whatever the term is, because this building, like so many in the Council's um, property portfolio, doesn't have the facility for that. But the film will be uploaded onto the Council's YouTube channel. At some point, probably tomorrow, I would think, it takes quite a time to download and then upload. So if anybody doesn't want to be filmed or doesn't want to be recorded speaking, please would you come and let um, Gary at the back know. Is that all right? Let him know. And he'll ask you to sit somewhere appropriate. Um, as some of you know, this forum is in a different format from previously. It's more community-focused with a new section called Chiswick Community Matters for our amazing local voluntary organizations to explain what they do and how councillors and residents can help them, and a new Chiswick Future section allowing us to look at a significant policy area in more detail. The public forum remains, of course, and that's half an hour your chance to ask questions of us councillors, of we councillors, anything you like, and if we can't answer it, we'll come back to you by email afterwards. Oh, yes. Okay, sure. Um, yeah. Getting to that bit. I haven't asked yet. I've got to that bit. Yeah, okay. Um, so the public forum remains, as I've said, and it's your chance to ask questions. And there is a form, that's what John was trying to explain to me, a form that you can fill in if you want to submit your question on paper by half past seven. That doesn't mean we won't ask you to put up your hands and ask questions, but if you know there's something you want to ask, do write it down and give John the form. John's on my right here. Um, we will try to take questions from the floor as well. Obviously, it's not only those that are filled in on paper. So first of all, introductions, in case you don't know who we are. <clears throat> we'll introduce ourselves one at a time, starting on your left and working left to right. We'll give you our name, the ward, and any portfolio that we might have. Starting yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening. My name is Councillor John Todd, and I'm uh, one of the three councillors in Chiswick Homefield Ward. I'm, my name is Councillor Michael Dennis. I'm one of the Chiswick Riverside uh, councillors, and um, I have a portfolio of h homes and homelessness. Hi, I'm Ron Mashiso, councillor for Turnham Green in Chiswick. My portfolio is um, shadow uh, children and young people uh, councillor in London Borough of Hanslow. Hello, I'm Ranjit Gill, councillor for Turnham Green, along with uh, Ron Mishisha on my right, and on the left, uh, Chair Joanna Bidoff. And your portfolio? Uh, I'm, I'm in charge of crime and policing. Oh, that's some terrible feedback. I'm uh, Councillor Gabriella Giles uh, for Chiswick Riverside. My portfolio is... <laughs> in... <laughs> yeah. Shall I carry on? <laughs> Oh, that's so much better. Uh, so my portfolios are um, crime, uh, the environment and culture, and uh, for the sake of today and declaring, um, what do we call, declare an interest, an interest. I'm uh, I sit as a trustee on the Chiswick Pier Trust um, on behalf of the council. Uh, my name is John Wyman White. I'm a council officer, um, and I'm here helping my colleague Chaspel to manage this evening. And I'm Councillor Joanna Bidolf, Turnham Green Ward with Ranjit and Ron, and I also run the Chiswick Shops Task Force to support our retail economy, so I have the retail portfolio, and I do that with Councillors Patrick Barr and Gabriella Giles. I'm Councillor Sam Hearn. I'm one of Chiswick Riverside's uh, three councillors. I am the group's spokesman on traffic and transport, which is obviously quite a busy portfolio last couple of years uh, and I'm the chair of Hounslow's pension board which is uh, an oversight body uh, uh, oversighting uh, what 
the council uh, does with the pension scheme, which has one point, around £1.2 billion invested for the benefit of employees and what are called admitted schemes. Hello, I'm Chaspal Sandhu. I'm here from Democratic Services, and my role is to support the Chiswick Area Forum. Thank you very much. Although my aim is to make these meetings much less municipal, we do have a couple of things that we have to run through quickly to meet our obligations. And that is, first of all, apologies. I know Councillor McGregor has sent his apologies. I just wanted to say that um, the Turnham Green Ward, oh. the name is going to be changed to Chiswick Gunnisbury. So, apologies for lateness for Councillor Bath. So Gabriella has already declared her interest as a trustee of Chiswick Peer Trust. Does anybody else have any interest to declare? Any other communications from councillors before we get on with the rest of the meeting? Thanks, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, we have promised a tracking list of subjects, which we will add to the uh, notes that go out with the meeting when we've started adding to it. We used to have some subjects that we're keeping a log of to make sure that they weren't forgotten. At the moment, there aren't any because of the pandemic, but there will be some, and we'll be adding to that list some useful uh, links for members of the public to have, including one which raised last week for the online watch link that the police have to let you know what's going on in your local area. It's Online, online watch link shortened to OWL, O-W-L. Okay, so let's move on to agenda item three. Um, and that is the first in our two sessions today on our community today and tomorrow. And I'd like to welcome Catherine Jago, chairman of the Chiswick Peer Trust, who will tell us more about the trust. Just as a simple introduction, it works to bring people to the river engaging them with the Thames through events, talks, and trips. And if it's all right with you, Catherine, we'll take questions after your talk. Is that all right? Lovely. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. And this sorry. Is my, this is my attractive assistant, okay, who's <laughs> going to answer all the questions that I can't answer. Um, now, look, can you hear me? If I, I quite like to stand up because then I can see your lovely faces. Is that all right? Can you hear me? Fine. Good. Oh. And even better, we have our presentation up there. So first of all, Joanna, I'd like to thank you so much and the rest of the councillors for inviting us here to present. Um, Joanna and I were having a conversation earlier. And uh, uh, I must admit, before I knew what Chiswick Peer Trust does, I thought I knew what it did, and I don't. <laughs> I do now, but it's, it's one of those things that you've probably heard of. You, you may have walked past the Peer House. Um, we used to have, although it, it wasn't ours, the restaurant Pizarro's next door to it. You may know that. Um, sadly, that has closed down and it's now uh, going to be developed into some apartments. But uh, we're next door to, to there. And uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for, for me and my beautiful assistant to tell you a little bit more about the trust. So um, our strap line is bringing local people to the river. And I'd like to show you how we've done that over the last 25 years. So would my wonderful assistant like to operate that because you'll be much better at doing that than I am. Thank you, Colin. It's different to the one I've got. Oh dear, <laughs> that's a challenge. <laughs> Hopefully do the right should no. move. Oh. Got it. Uh, that's the one I had before. That's it, the pretty picture. So this is uh, a view of the pier house um, and the pier taken obviously from the river. Um, it's a glorious photograph, I think. And we've been running Chiswick Pier House and the pontoon for the last 25 years. Um, we believe we've been running it very successfully. Uh, and during that time, to the next slide please, um, let me tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, we're a self-funding charity to support the local community and our income essentially comes from the moorings. We have some beautiful houseboats down there and if you haven't 
walked past there recently, we put up a very, very interesting sign that tells you all about them. And they really are very interesting boats. I think we have two, is it two Dunkirk boats? Yes. I think we've got two Dunkirk boats. So do have a look at that. So we get uh, an income from the moorings. We also have commercial and some small craft um, that uh, come in to our, our pier. Um, we also get money, or we used to until the last 18 months, from rent renting out our hall and confer conference rooms and spaces for charities to come and meet. And we also do, needless to say, a lot of fundraising. And the money that we raise through all of that pays for a number of charitable organisations and organisations that bring people to the river. Well, the first one, the base for the Chiswick RNLI. Actually, that hopefully brings people out of the river, and I don't mean that in a flippant way. <laughs> they, of course, have been extremely active over the last 18 months. And, and who was it that said they saw that you did, didn't you? There was apparently a, a, a program on recently about the RNLI, and it, it misquoted, actually, I have to correct them. It did say that the uh, RNLI at Chiswick was the busiest RNLI station. We'd love to make that claim, but I'm afraid we only come second. <laughs> but we are second busiest in the country, and we come second to Tower Bridge. We are extremely busy uh, with rescuing people there, and it's been phenomenal over the last 18 months. So we provide a base for the RNLI. We also provide a base for something called the Thames Explorer Trust. Now, this is a marvelous organization that organizes mudlarking, amongst other things. So that brings youngsters and adults to the actual riverbed to bring to them a completely new dimension to getting muddy. And they come down and they have a fantastic time and they work phenomenally well with the local schools and we are very much supportive of them. We also have, operating from the pier and the pier house, a canoe and kayak club that has over 100 members and they're going out regularly and also the local sea cadets. And uh, I, I have to say, we have uh, every year something called the party on the pier. And this year, we asked them if they would help in uh, getting people onto the free boat rides that we organized up and down the river. And they came in their uniform, and they looked so smart. <laughs> they were absolutely lovely. And they did a phenomenal job. And uh, I must admit, I felt a lot of pride in what they did. Uh, they're a tremendous group. So what else do we do with the money that we raise? Well, we also do boat trips for handicapped youngsters and disadvantaged people and people who may not otherwise get the opportunity of coming down to the river and, and enjoying it. And we also are a venue for exhibitions and events. And going back to what I was saying about mudlarking, we've just had a phenomenally uh, popular event over two days with 15 exhibitors of what they found from their mudlarking experiences. And we ha we, we, it had previously been at St. Paul's, and they had 1,000 people over the two days. Well, we, we didn't think out here in little old Chiswick that we'd get anything like that. I think it was 800 and, 810 people <laughs> came to see this mudlarking exhibition. It was fantastic. And that's a wonderful thing to bring probably different people down to see what they can enjoy on the river. Um, we also like to promote uh, river-related issues as well. And in linking that, uh, you may have heard about the sad demise of Freddy, Freddy the seal. <laughs> um, it was very sad. And we have now got together with a seal organization. And forgive me, Colin, you might know the name of it, but... Uh, uh, it's called Seal Watch. Thank you, Gabriella. <laughs> Another very useful assistant down there, thank you. Um, Seal Watch. 
And we are having a, a talk from Seal Watch, who's going to tell us all about what you should and shouldn't do if you meet a seal. And I, I actually, I love the river. I love being on the river, in the river, and under the river. Um, but uh, I row from Richmond a lot, and I would say at least once a month we see a seal. They are really much more common than you might think. So, so that's one of the, the river-related issues that we, we get involved with. Um, so, next slide, please. So, to encapsulate what we like to do is we like to aim to bring people to the river to enjoy, to educate, and to enlighten. And how have we done this in terms of monetary measures? Well, we would conservatively say that over the 25 years, we have probably spent at least a million pounds supporting people and encouraging them to the river in a safe and enjoyable and, and hopefully educational way. And this um, photograph that you see here is obviously some of the mudlarkers having the most fantastic time. I bet you all know youngsters children, grandchildren, friends, children, and whatever, who would absolutely love to get their welly boots on. I know that I'm dying to do it. I've just got a group of friends who I'm going to get together and we're going to go down and do it. Um, as I mentioned, we'll have the next slide, please. Uh, probably our, our biggest support of about 300,000 is to the RNLI. And you may recall the tragedy of the Marchioness disaster in, in 1989 when... And, and I couldn't believe this. When I went back to check it, 51 people lost their lives. I mean, that's a horrendous disaster. And there was an inquiry um, in 2000. And as a result, the RNLI decided they needed another base in this area. And so they decided that they would like it around here, and Chiswick Peer Trust offered them that space. And as you can see, I'm being honest, it is the second busiest. <laughs> so, um, and lockdown has seen many more rescues. Uh, we work very closely with the RNLI to try to encourage people to understand the risks. It is horrifying, and it's particularly been evident over the last 18 months, where people, and it's wonderful to see them, that they want to swim in the river and, and get in, onto the water with kayaks and everything else, but they do not understand the dangers. The strength of that tide is, is horrendous at times, and I know this because I'm a rower, and I'm also a wild swimmer, so I know the dangers of that. And the RNLI have some wonderful uh, educational things that we like to support, and we're looking at some quite innovative ways of, of also educating people about the dangers. And our ambition is we want to support the RNLI to be where they are, and they want to develop the station here. They see this as the, one of their main areas to be um, for on the Thames in particular. Thank you. And a few other pictures here. There's our wonderful sea cadets that I was telling you about where I, I had a little surge of pride when I saw them in their uniforms. Uh, that's a little girl in front of the RNLI stand at the party on the pier, and obviously those are some, some kayaks. Um, but I, what I want to make sure you recognize is that we are still looking to expand our offerings. We have had a bit of a changeover. Um, I've actually only been involved in the Trust for less than two years. Colin, a year, is it? Yep, just about coming up to about Coming up to a year. Um, and I think it's always good to have new people involved in these things whilst not chucking out the old because they have a wealth of knowledge. And we have some wonderful trustees who've been with the trust for almost since its inception. And that's invaluable to have. But we are keen to get more trustees um, we always have councillors as trustees, two councillors. We have one place, but I believe we have to get a balance on that. Gabriella is our, our sort of uh, uh, conservative representative, but we also have a Labour one. Um, sorry, was that a question? Or? We always have two, yes, but uh, we need one on, from Labour and one conservative, I believe. So, But we'll check on that, will you, Gabriella? Yeah, we're going to check on proportionality. Yeah. Um, but we would, love, we would love new trustees as well to join us. Um, so we are 
continuing to do new and exciting things. We're reaching out to some of the local schools to make sure that our offerings to them match their needs. Uh, we are looking to sponsor individuals to get trained up so they can take people out on the kayaks, on the uh, canoes. Um, we are very keen to help work with the RNLI to provide a fit-for-purpose lifeboat station because right now what we have is not ideal. Um, for example, when they bring casualties in at the moment, they've got no privacy. And I know if I was being brought in, I don't want the whole world watching me. So uh, it's that sort of thing we want to work with them on. Um, as I mentioned, we are looking to fund novel ways to encourage safe use of the river. Um, and of course, we're continuing to fund the organizations that I've mentioned, like the Thames Explorer Trust, uh, to get more children down there to enjoy these wonderful mudlarking events. Um, next slide, please. Of course, like a lot of organizations, our biggest challenge at the moment is financial, but we also have the challenge of securing our future for another 30 years. Our lease sadly runs out in five years' time. We would love to have another 30 years, if we can, um, because that will help us work with the RNLI, uh, and they will make some substantial investments, we hope. Um, so far, sadly, we're only being offered 15 years, but we're, we're working on it, and we're going to do our best to see if we can get that 30 years. Um, thank you. Um, so what are the sorts of things that we're trying to do to increase our, our revenue? Um, well, we have a balance to make because we want to still be doing our charitable work, but in order to do that, we need to make some money. Um, but we have a wonderful venue there. Um, please do go down and have a look at it if you don't know it. Um, and so we're looking at ways in which we can capitalize on that. And hopefully next year, for example, the boat race is going to happen again. Uh, and fingers crossed. Uh, and if that's the case, then I don't see why we couldn't explore the possibility of having a camera on the top of the, of the pier house. Um, I gather Sky pays quite a lot of money for things like that. So a bit of banners and, you know. So we're gonna look at innovative ways of how we can make some more money. Um, we may even do some crowdfunding. Um, I personally have never tried it, but I'm sure there'll be trustees or other people who would help us do that. Um, we have been offering online talks, and we hope to do some more of those. Uh, we've got a, a wonderful list of possible speakers, very exciting about that. Um, we're looking at widening our membership. We're also looking at offering a coffee bar down there, because so many people have said Pissarro's was such a wonderful uh, place to go to. And so we're looking at that. We may even do some pop-up restaurants. So all sorts of exciting things happening. Um, and we're also looking to maximize our rental income, but we can't compromise our, our, our core users and the charitable work that we're doing. Thank you. Next one. Um, so we, I would welcome your questions, and I know Colin is dying to answer the ones that I can't answer. So, but we'd love your questions now, but most importantly, we'd love it if you would come down and enjoy what we can offer. So I put a few ideas here as to what you or anybody that you might know might like to do. So come and join the canoe and, and kayaking club or sea cadets, uh, book a mudlarking experience. As I say, that's what I'm going to do. Um, enjoy our range of talks that are online. You can see them and uh, we record them and they can be looked at uh, retrospectively. Um, contact us if you know an organization that would enjoy a boat trip. We are, we've done a number of these. They've been very, very successful. And it's a, a wonderful thing to see. We do a lot of work with MenCap and they absolutely love going on boats and going out on the river. Uh, so do let us know. Uh, Come to use the pier house for your next party or meeting or, or, or whatever you might be doing. Um, join the trust, become a trustee. Uh, contact us if you know a school or organization who would be interested in what we offer. Uh, we do support 
uh, schools to pay for the Thames Explorer Trust to offer their mudlarking experience to those schools. So please think about that. Uh, please, if you've got any wonderful fundraising ideas, we're always open <laughs> for those sorts of things. But, you know, we've got a lovely venue, so you may have the idea we can provide the venue. So let us know. Um, provide any support that you can. But most of all, would you mind talking about us? to your friends, to anybody that you know, and just tell them about us. Because as far as I'm concerned, I totally agree with this. Believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so worth doing as simply messing about on boats, and I'd add, near the river. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Cathy. And uh, if you're right, we'll have some questions. Oh, there. please. That lovely. would be lovely. Thanks. Colin, why I'll, don't you go I'll there? go with councillors first, and that gets us out of the way. Um, does anybody have a question or a point they'd like to make? Ron, Councillor Mishito. Thank you so much, Ms. Jagov. Um, oh, please call me Cathy. Catherine. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was quite interested in what you're saying about, obviously, I'm, I'm quite into sports, so the boat race coming back is, is, is a big thing. But... If you, I've got a couple of questions. So the first one is, how come we never had BBC cameras on, uh, on the Peer Trust in the past? And, and I like the idea of getting the sky cameras if the boat race does come that way again. Which, that's the first question. And the second question is on that is, do we advertise directly to Cambridge and Oxford, to their, their houses? Because I know they train on the river all year round. Do they know that there's a facility there to hire during the, um, the, the spring boat race month. Right, um, uh, in answer to your question, why haven't we had a, a camera there before? The yeah. answer is, I asked exactly the same question when I got involved. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I, I agree, I think it's a no brainer and it's certainly something that we'll look at. Um, in terms of direct contact with the Oxford and Cambridge boat clubs, we haven't done that yet, we're rather waiting um, to, to see what happens on the, the race. Um, but I'm personally, I was a member of Putney Town Rowing Club, so I'm familiar with that group, and that's a very good idea. I yeah. think we will certainly uh, do that. I think that's an <coughs> excellent suggestion. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank, thank you for responding to one of the things that uh, Kathy put up, uh, which is about give us some ideas, because yes. we, yeah. we, we, we want more ideas. Just on that, I mean, usually uh, the, the, the Oxford and Cambridge I'm, I'm, I'm associated with is the rugby and often the, uh, we get in touch when I say we, I meant when I was at Richmond Rugby Club we get in touch with Oxford and tell them that we can host them and we can do all sorts and then they, we give them the price and then uh, they come back as to whether they will take us on, on that offer or not but my last point um, was to do with the offer you're suggesting to uh, schools and other facilities around Chiswick yeah. Um, we had last time a great presentation from the Hogarth Youth Centre and I would really like to, to have an, um, a situation where we do have a connection between um, different organisations as, as we have brought them together through this, um, through this community kind of gathering. Um, so if a group such as Hogarth Youth Centre brought a, a, you know, 15 or 20 teenagers that wanted to have the experience of the boat, do we have the the kind of the trained uh, operators to get young people who are often perhaps they, they need to be properly vetted and checked and safety measures all put in place. Do we have that kind of facility to actually help and do and offer this service and the costing behind it as well? Yeah, we are currently working with our canoe and kayak club to develop that. Um, I have to say this part of the river it can be quite challenging so therefore, in general, at the moment, they're not taking youngsters younger than 16 because it really is quite challenging. And it it's also can not be such a good experience for them. So we don't want to take them too young. But we are looking at the opportunities of taking that sort of age group. And we are looking as a trust at funding the training of somebody to do exactly that. Um, and... Also, if they're under 16, they can always sign up to be a sea cadet. That's true, of yeah. course. Yes. Thank you, Gabriella. <laughs> 
Any other questions from councillors? Yes, Ranjit, Ranjit Gill. You talked about fundraising. Uh, I mean, I do quite a few fundraisers. What's the capacity for? I believe for a standing up event, it's 100. I think for sit down, it depends on how you lay it out. I think it's 70. But I could come back to you on that. Right, okay. So it's, I, I'd call it an intimate space. It's not a space, it's not as big as this, obviously. But of course, we're so lucky because we're right by the river. Yeah. Yes. So uh, that's what I was thinking about. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's, I, I, it's a I good, good opportunity. That. I, I had a, a birthday party there before, in fact, I was the trustee. Uh, and we, we took um, 65 people sitting down for a meal on a sunny day, and it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the fundraisers I'm thinking of is mainly to do with Indian festivals, which require a lot more space and more people. Yeah. Um, so that's what I was thinking about, and also for weddings. Uh, absolutely. We have a wonderful venue there, and of course, yeah. we also have the space for you to bring a boat alongside if you were actually doing a, a, an event on the boat as well. Oh, great. I so that's, that's that, worth thinking That's a about. selling point. Yeah. Thank yes, you. we do. And maybe we'll, we'll talk later then. Please yeah. do. Yes, okay. yeah. very much so. Sam Hearn. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I was a trustee for eight or nine years. So I've done my time before the mast. <laughs> um, There's another mast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a, a, a couple of things. Um, I don't think you mentioned the cost of membership. That might be useful to... That's very kind of you. It's, I think it's something astounding like... £12. £12. Pounds. 12 pounds. <laughs> right. And what, what do you get for your £12? Pounds? Uh, well, we are currently reviewing this because up until uh, lockdown, you got the opportunity to attend the talks for free. Since lockdown, because we've been doing them virtually, we have only been asking for donations. So it's not quite such an incentive as it, as it was before. In other words, the talks are essentially free, sorry. Um, but uh, we are looking now at what offering we can make to yeah. people. And perhaps if there's a, I mean, I'm talking completely off the top of my head, but for example, if we opened a coffee bar, maybe there will be a 10% reduction or a free coffee once a month or, you know, I don't know yet. Yeah. We're, we're looking at all those sort of yeah. things. Uh, I actually chair what's called the um, events committee and uh, we, we offer cruises and we, we offer a discount to members for, ah, the, right. for coming on those cruises. So we've got two cruises lined up. Uh, one is to Battersea Fireworks and the other one is uh, go, ha having a cup of tea and going down to Westminster Bridge and coming back again. And both of these are actually uh, available on our website to book. If you wanted to paint a seal figuratively, not that actually, <laughs> then unfortunately that one's full up. But if you are a budding artist, put up and we'll, we'll do another one because we, we actually double up and do things again when the demand is there. And, and, and finally, uh, you, You've, you've mentioned your, your landlord is uh, Hounslow Council, and, and I know uh, Gabriella's uh, been working hard on, on the trust behalf, but um, what, what could the rest of the councillors be doing in order to kind of close that gap for you? If they could encourage the council to see the benefits of offering us the 30-year lease to help us work with the RNLI and also with everyone else to know that we've got another 30 years future. Um, the work that we do is not something that suddenly happens overnight. We need to know that there's scope for investing uh, and developing what we want to do. We would like to spend some money on the Peer House in conjunction with the RNLI's aspirations. It's hard to justify that if you only have a relatively short lease of 15 years. We would really like to have 30 years. We think we've got so much that we can offer in bringing people to what has to be one of the best assets mm. for, for Hounslow, the river. C can I just add, I don't know whether anybody, everybody in this room knows, but the trust wasn't set up by a philanthropic uh, group of people. It was actually set up by the council. Mm. So the council created Chiswick Pier Trust and 
created what was called a self-funding model. So we were supposed to be funded by the, the mooring and the, the sales and those sort. Our costs have gone up and up and up, and our rent has gone up and up and up. So it's, it's, as far as we perceive it, it's in the council's interest to continue to support us because they set us up to do what we're trying to do. I think we can all agree with that. Um, <laughs> just one more for Gabriella, and then we'll come to Peep. Sorry to keep you waiting. So I already know the answer to this question, but when is the next talk? You, you or shall I answer my own question? Gabriella's <laughs> going to be leading it. So, yeah, so, I, I will be so I will be comparing it, but the next talk will be um, around seals in the river, um, and it will be on the 26th of October at 7.30. Um, so take a look at the website, sign up, and um, book your place for the talk. Yeah. Can I just add, add to that as well? If you go onto our website, um, Cathy said we now stream them. Uh, and what we've, so anybody can actually look for free at any of the talks that uh, we've done over the previous period. And what we're finding is that teachers and other sorts of people are coming in, that would be really, really helpful for pe uh, people in our school. So future program of talks, what we're doing, is we're linking those where we can to the curriculum of the primary and secondary schools and up to developing a program that meets the educational needs of the children, but also helps people actually learn a bit more about things that are going on the river. So coming back to three E's up there, we're actually really motoring as hard as we can on education. Thank you, and I'm sorry I forgot that I saw John's hand as well. John Todd. Yeah, um, I'm a councillor, um, and I look after the interests of the council too. You just made a statement I'd like to challenge with respect. You said the rent had been put up and up and up and up. Can you tell me when your rent was last put up? Yes, I can tell you, actually. It was put up uh, about two years ago in terms of the rent that we actually paid. Uh, the reason being was that up until then, we had been given a discount on our rent of 75%. That was suddenly taken away, which meant that our rent went up from about 5,500 to over 20,000 um, almost overnight. Um, and it's looking like, if we are able to get an agreement, that our rent is going to go up substantially. And when I say substantially, we're talking of 50% or more. Um, so it, it is a challenge for us. Okay. But we're there to, do, to, 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 you know, yeah. to take that challenge. We're not giving up. <laughs> so. Okay, I'll leave that. I, I'll challenge that anyway. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'll just come to you. Just, I don't want to ask a question, but I would just like to make one point, which is that you are at the end of the wonderful E3 bus route. Very, very easy to get to. Is that right? We are indeed. Yes. <laughs> just in case people are wondering, how do I get there? Because not everybody knows. Uh, Ruth. Thank you. Could you say uh, who you are and uh, if you represent any groups, thank you. let us know. Uh, Ruth Mayorkas, local resident. Uh, thank you. Fascinating talk and thank you, Colin. And I have been to do's there and it is fantastic. Um, two things, though. With the boat race coming back again, I don't know if you're aware of something called Thames 21, which is uh, yes. trying to get rid of plastic on the river. And, of course, any events like the boat race cause the most shocking amount of plastic going into the river. I did speak to a couple of your guys at one of your events who were saying that they're using up the plastic that they've already got rather than waste it, which is very good. Um, but I did suggest that as a fundraising thing, a lot of venues like Twickenham Rugby do their own reusable cups, which are not made of plastic, but they're made of something, and you brand it with mm. the name of your place, and then people buy them for a pound and they either give you them back to wash to reuse, or most people will keep them like me because they're a very good memento. Yeah. So um, I'm interested to know what you're doing about plastics and recycling. And then my other one, very quickly, and then you can answer them both, is we have a real problem of no toilets along that stretch of the river. Um, and Richmond have a scheme where certain cafes sign up to being somewhere anyone can go to the toilet at any time, even if they're not eating, drinking there. And I wondered if you could encourage council to have that kind of scheme and that you would be 
open for people to use the loo because it is a problem. Thank you. Yes, those are two excellent suggestions. Um, I'll, I'll take the plastic cups and you take the loos. Does um, that sound like a good deal? <laughs> I was going to suggest the other way around, <laughs> <laughs> um, In terms of reusable cups, it is something that we're looking at um, because uh, obviously the last two years which is the two years I've been involved, it's been so totally different. It's been really hard. But we want to make these changes and we want to look at that. Um, I'll just, as a sort of aside, um, I think I mentioned I rode from Richmond Bridge. And there, um, uh, uh, Mark Edwards, who you may know, is the, uh, he was the original boat builder for the wonderful Gloriana. Um, he's actually been supporting some boats that are made of recycled plastic. Uh, that's been up there. Uh, but yes, we'd be very interested in something like that, uh, particularly if we can brand them. So thank you very much for that suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. And over to you about the loose Colin. No, I, I, I'm <laughs> going to stay with the plastic cups. Okay. For a short while, we had a coffee bike outside, which some of you may have seen. And they, they are recyclable cups, which they yeah. use. They, they weren't ones that you could go on using forever. But... Um, Sorry, just because this is something that people don't realise. Recyclable cups only recycle if they're put into particular recycling no, no, facility. They degraded it. They so if they drop into the river, yeah, then yeah. they're still detritus that doesn't break down. Know, so but other, but that, that's what, important. What, what, yeah, sorry, what we did do is collect them, but I, I take your point. Yeah, no, that's good. I'll, all right, I'll deal with the news. Um, <laughs> again, because of COVID, uh, it's, it's a difficult problem at the moment because we also have the RNLI there and the RNLI are still isolating. They have been told they must isolate. But actually thinking about it, we do have external access to some loos, don't we? There are Which, two, uh, two outside loos with a key, uh, key yeah, code. Yeah, with a key code. So that's something we might be able to do. Um, there are issues um, with respect to... Um, keeping them clean and, and, and all of that. But uh, yeah, thank you for the suggestion. And can we charge people for using them? Only a penny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just before, I'd like to just make a comment on the loos as well, because we're um, already starting a campaign for the scheme that you mentioned, which Richmond runs, it's CTS, Community Toilet Scheme, whereby the council there gives the business that is offering their loo to the public a discount on rates. So we've approached Hounslow on that, but we're also trying to get some public loos installed in Chiswick, because there just is not anywhere to go. Chair, can I intervene on that point? Yep. Very, very briefly, thank you. Um, there is going to be a toilet on Duke's Meadow in, in or near the bandstand. You'll probably notice they're knocking down the old ones, and in the plan, there's a toilet to go there. Exact location to be confirmed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Peter, sorry to keep. Peter Hogan, associated with Chiswick since 1967. Uh, I'd like a point to be clarified. You mentioned weddings. Are you offering the reception for weddings? Have you not thought of being licensed as a venue? Because I don't think there are that many places along the Thames that offer such a service. We are only at the moment thinking of, well, no, sorry, we're not thinking. At the moment, we can only offer receptions, but from now onwards, we'll think about getting the license, because yeah. I think that's an excellent idea. Um, we have just uh, created a new committee that's been run by a new trustee who, who runs wonderful, an international chain of hotels, who is going to be mm -hmm. looking at the opportunities, and I will take that immediately yeah. to him yeah. and suggest that as a possibility. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, can I ask whether you... Well, like I have to, to ask my wife first. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask whether you'd like to become a trustee and join that committee? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from anybody here? Um, there is somebody there, well, again, I keep on having to caveat it, there, there used to be somebody there, generally in the morning, 
Um, so we're not routinely open at any time. But we're going to be reviewing this if we're going to have a coffee bar or restaurant or something like that. Um, it's, it's generally being used by people who've either booked it or it's one of the core users um, that we're offering. Now, having said that, of course, the RNLI are there 24-7. Um, so. If anybody happens to be walking past Pier House and they notice lots of school children down on the river, the loos at the back will be open. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else from anybody? Oh, sorry, yes. This will have to be the last one, I'm afraid. Uh, Charlotte Aldridge, local resident. I've just got one question, because it's something that always interests me about charities, is how many... Um, of your staff, as it were, are volunteers, and how many are paid staff? And uh, is it the volunteers who organize um, uh, the, the many activities that you've described? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have two paid staff at the moment. Um, one who is there as a sort of administrator. There's a lot of work that has to be done to manage those buildings and the pier, as you can imagine. Um, she would normally be there in the mornings, uh, so she's part-time. Uh, we have had two people, but one has, has recently uh, stepped down to do a, a full-time job. Uh, so we now have one part-time person who does things like uh, managing our, our, our website and helping to organize the events. But most of the time, it's uh, ideas coming from her, but also from the trustees, and then we rely a lot on, on voluntary uh, help. So uh, that voluntary help doesn't need to come, well, and we hope it won't just come from the trustees. So if anybody is interested in getting involved in any of the sorts of things that I've told you about, um, we would welcome you with open arms, as you can imagine. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that's everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Is there anything else you'd like to add, you two, Cathy and Colin? No, no. no. See, you, see you by the river sometime. <laughs> Please come down. Absolutely. I've been to party on the pier many times, and it's a huge amount of fun. I love your band. Um, yes, they are good, aren't they? <laughs> they're excellent. And mudlarking is an awful lot of fun as well, so do give it a try. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks. So we now move on to the second of our Chiswick Community Matters sessions, um, and this is now Move Into Wellbeing, where we're going to hear from Donna Schoenherr, who is the founder of Move Into Wellbeing, which supports people with Parkinson's disease or other mobility restrictions through music and movement to build balance, coordination, confidence, and general well-being. Thank you very much, Cathy. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you very much to Councillor Bidoff and everyone here for inviting us. Uh, this is quite a, a big thing for us. We're a small charity, we're a young charity, so this is quite an honor. Um, my name is Donna, I'm the founder and director of the charity, and I have with me Amanda Zachariah, who's a trustee, and she's uh, here to lend me some support this evening, and maybe a bit of technical support as well. As you can see, that's just our logo and our website. Um, our introduction page. Um, I'd actually like to go on to the next slide, please. Okay, so why are we here and what made me found this charity? My father had Parkinson's disease for over 30 years and I had been a professional dancer and I had worked with many people who were using dance and movement in therapeutic and holistic ways. Uh, I, I'm originally from America, which is where my original training was. And I moved to Chiswick over 25 years ago with my husband. In the back of my head, I always thought I'd like to do something myself to help people with mobility issues, with neurological disorders. I wanted to get my hands in, but I, I had a young child and I was also running Ballet for Life, which is another dance organization. Eventually, when the time was right, I started to research and reach out and, and talk to colleagues and talk to my staff at Ballet for Life about per, perhaps teaching 
for me in this new program I wanted to initiate. So um, that was in 2014, the concept. In 2015, we gave our first classes at the Arts Educational School just up the road. Um, and the rest is our little history because it's, as you can see, so it's in the memory of my father, but I like to call it a living tribute to anyone who has to suffer with any kind of uh, mobility disorder or neurological condition. So it's a, it's, it's a positive affirmative thing so that to try to help people to better their, uh, their quality of life. And it also affects their family and their carers and their friends because when they can come to a class and have an enjoyable experience, it, it, there's a trickle down effect that, that lasts longer than just the hour of the class. In the class, it's a fully structured dance and movement class. It starts seated in chairs. It's done to music. Each exercise is very uh, structured and, and we give the exercise to the group. We adapt anything and everything that might need adapting. So for example, if someone can't do a certain movement, we have another suggestion, or if someone cannot stand, we do seated movement throughout the whole class with them. Um, the teachers are, are very specialized, uh, just not any person could teach these classes and not any average dance teacher could teach these classes because you, you have to be trained, you have to uh, have a different approach to giving the movement and explaining the movement and structuring the class. So it's, it's quite, a, quite a challenging uh, role for, for a teacher to take on, but it's extremely rewarding and fulfilling and all the teachers that have started with us have grown and I was just speaking with one of our members who's here, we were saying how, how much fun it is and how wonderful the teacher is. So that just shows you one of the places we have the class. That's uh, up the road on Southfield Road at St. Peter's Hall. Um, and eight years serving our community. And we could go to the next slide, please. So we, we started out here, and we started out small, but we've kept an international sort of networking going on because uh, this is happening all over the world now. There's an organization in New York called Dance for PD, which started this whole thing over, I think, about 15 years ago. And one of my colleagues is the head of that, who is David Leventhal. But he trains thousands of teachers who now go out all over the world to all different venues. They can be in opera houses, they can be in schools, dance companies, theater companies, and they give this class in their community. So it's, it's a really large organization now. And he, he has mentored some of our teachers and he gave us this lovely quote that, that I wanted to, to share. Um, we could go to the next, please. Well, then guess what happened? Um, COVID came and we were we locked the studio doors and we had about 30 lovely people that were just left hanging, stranded, isolated, uh, without so many things that they really valued, such as the sense of the community, the getting together, the movement. Um, so we, within about a week and a half, we went online and started offering two classes a week on Zoom. And we started to serve not just, London, not just Chiswick and not just London and not just England and not just the UK, but we started working all, with people all over the world. And we had an amazing experience doing this. It was a very uh, high learning curve to put dance, a three-dimensional uh, art form and uh, structure into, into this setup. Uh, and we had many um, awkward glitches along the way and freezes and people, you know, cats and people wandering in and out of classrooms and all, I'm sure you've experienced that in your, all your groups that you have online. But it was a tremendous lifeline and, and really an important, important thing to have done and we're really proud that we did that and we're proud that we could carry on. And some people actually still are online with us and so we still have online and we're back in the studios, but we still have the online program. And we have a Google Classroom, which is an archival uh, system. So if someone just wanted to look up an exercise or have a couple of exercises at home at their own pace, they can do that. 
So there's, we're trying to kind of please everybody. We also did a lot of ringing, ringing up and just chatting with people. When we could visit on the curbside, we did visits with people. So we just tried to maintain that sense of continuity and community so they weren't feeling so abandoned. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, so this, the, the fund for all is actually a bit of a sarcastic comment. It was supposed to have a different font, but we couldn't get that. But that was, that was in, in, in regard to all the little glitches that we occurred with the teachers and frustrations over internet connections dropping out and all that. But um, there's some lovely quotes here from the people who do attend. Um, and we will keep, we will keep all the digital work and we will keep uh, live streaming. We also live stream the class on Saturday from St. Peter's Hall. We're still working on sound issues there in the big echoey hall. But it is now a vital part of what, what we offer and we won't, we won't be stopping that. So that's just to get a little feel of, of that. Next one, please. So, how are we connected to our community? Well, we, we actually do, we do a lot in the general area. Uh, at present, we work with London Borough of Hounslow's Over 60s Activities Program, which we were on pre-COVID and then it got shut down and it's just restarted. We give two classes a week at sheltered accommodation schemes in the Borough of Hounslow to the elderly residents, some of whom have not done anything in a year and a half and are just so happy to be able to come into the common room or the activity room and do something together. Um, we are going to be doing some taster sessions at St. Mary's and St. Luke's in Austerley coming up in Hounslow. We're working with the Hounslow Senior Trust who have their beautiful festival uh, every autumn which they didn't have last year but now they're having it this year and that's at the Musical Museum in Brentford, other, they have it in other venues, but we're teaching classes there. And our, our classes actually already got fully booked, so they're adding more of our classes because it's quite a popular, popular thing, so we'll, we'll be looking forward to welcoming people there. Um, I will, we do a lot with the radio and the local press, Chiswick Buzz, Chiswick W4, Chiswick Calendar. Uh, we just did an interview on River Radio um, we give taster classes at Age UK and Age Concern and talks, and I've met some of you at some of those events. And um, we, yeah, we've had some open days through the National Lottery Community Grant Award. We're, we're a very open and welcoming group, so if someone wants to come and visit, it, it, we always make it so that one feels welcome to come and do so. Just with space limitations, we would have to know how many people might want to come only because of COVID and social distancing, and so forth. That's just, uh, sometimes we have a little coffee and tea event after classes, that's okay. And then this is just to show some of the recognition from the greater community and from different uh, bodies that give out awards. Um, that was a very wonderful evening uh, with the Atul Patak community fund where we won a community award and that was at the House of Commons. We've uh, just become finalists of the Hounslow Business Awards 2021 for best charity and social enterprise. So we'll find out in November how we fare there. And we've been commended before by them. And also, yes, you can see that. So, and there's some others, but I think we got tired of putting up the badges. So I thought that was enough. But, it, it's lovely to have this, but what, why this really means something to me is that any time there's a recognition like this, it opens more doors for us to introduce our work to others and to apply for funding at different foundations. So it's, it's always helpful, these, these uh, types of things. And next one, please. Oh, that's fancy. So I, I'd like to end with, um, if you can go back, there's a video. Uh, we go back to that last slide. There's just a little promo video that just gives a feeling of um, what we do in the class. Oh, okay. Yep. Yes, please.
are off, throw and smash it. Nowhere to be seen. The top of the head to the ceiling, shoulder relaxed to the side, planting your feet spreading right into the floor. Check the watch. And up, up, and down. And then the third time I bend my knees, I transfer my weight onto the one leg, and you see I flex. Perfect. Amazing. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Donna. That was wonderful to see. I hadn't had no idea. So thank you very much for that. Oh, pleasure. Move on to questions then. Any from councillors? Councillor Gill. Thank you, Donna. That was really v very good, uh, very well presented, and Thank I like the last bit with the video. I think good. that was excellent, really. <laughs> um, you mentioned you're a charity, yes. um, but you didn't uh, say how you're funded. Are you funded by the council as well? Uh, we, uh, we are funded by um, foundations, such as the Garfield Weston Fund, the foundation, uh, the Doily Cart Foundation, the... David K of uh, the Emmanuel K Foundation. Uh, we've received grants through uh, National Lottery, through Tesco Bag, through Waitrose Community Matters. Um, we we would normally have fundraising events, but we haven't been able to the last year and a half. Right. And we're always writing um, grant applications. Uh, we're currently working on one right now for the Foil Foundation, um, and we used to receive. Uh, lovely help from the Southfield Ward and the Borough of Ealing, but that, that fund dried up. Right. And maybe, Amanda, is there anything I forgot? Because she would maybe know better. No, I haven't forgotten any. Um, you haven't forgotten any, Donna, but essentially the point is that we're totally reliant on grants and our own efforts to raise money. Right. So, so we have no... Do, you, do the public uh, also, can they make donations? Yes. yes. <laughs> I mean, you don't yes. do any fundraising. Yes. But you say you have uh, classes in. So, are you just based in one one particular studio, or do you actually go around, say, to um, care homes and things like that? Yeah. So we we we're currently in in two sets of homes in 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 uh, Hounslow. Right. Um, um, Kirkstone and Boswood home house. Uh, we. Um, in Chiswick, our, our venue is St. Peter's Hall. Um, and then, we, yes, we go to places and give the class as a taster class or where we become guests somewhere and give the class. Mm. Uh, we, we are also on um, Easy Fundraising and Smile Amazon for anyone who does their online shopping. Move into Wellbeing is a, is a choice that one can make. And yes, we accept private donations. And we do ask for a donation for the class if someone is able to pay. Um, yeah, but, that was my next question to you. Yeah, there is, there is a suggested fee, but we never would turn anyone away who, who would not be able to pay that fee. Yeah, and you still carry on with your Zoom. Uh, yes, yes. So yeah. really, I mean, that's available to everybody because that's, that's right. really, yes. a, you know, the yeah. exercises are not restricted to people with just mobility exactly. problems. Exactly, yes. Yeah, I no, think it's, it's a healthy, yeah. healthy atmosphere yeah. to promote. And so. we're, we're seeing more and more, uh, you know, conditions, you know, we're working with people with long COVID, with ME, MS, early stage dementia, dyspraxia, uh, joint stiffness, people who've had uh, joint replacements. So it's, Correct. yes, yeah, quite a broad, broad range. Yeah, because I was just going to ask you about dementia, whether you actually do classes for people with dementia. Yeah, well, we, have, we do have some people with early stage dementia, and I've actually worked with Arts for Dementia Charity and developed a dance course for them years ago. Um, which I would like to revisit because that was 
hugely successful and rewarding and, and is needed. I mean, I was just looking at statistics today. One out of every 14 persons has dementia in the UK. One out of every six persons has a neurological condition. 14.1 um, million are disabled and 137,000 people have Parkinson's and there's 17,000 new cases every year. Yes. So sadly, um, those numbers are are not <laughs> going down, and no. the need for things like dance and movement uh, are, are very important. Yeah, well, I would like to um, actually help you, so maybe we can talk later. All right, All brilliant, right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, we did as an area forum have uh, some small amounts of funds, so uh, that was all reorganized at, and at the beginning of COVID, so I'm not sure what the current arrangements is, but perhaps you'd like to talk to us about that. All not right. huge sums of money, but for it's for things that wouldn't be funded in in, in another way, or mm -hmm. and that, that has a direct benefit to Brilliant. the community. Um, it, it, it of course might be wrong, but the the charity commission website said you're not registered for gift aid. Is that? No, we, sorry, yes, we are. We're a fully registered with the charity commission, and yes, we are registered for gift aid. So. And, it, and we collect that with donations. We have a, a treasurer who makes sure that we do all of that. Thank you. Gabriella. Yeah. Um, can I introduce you to a little organization called the Chiswick Peer Trust who have some space who might be able to help <laughs> you with your... <laughs> We've already chatted. Oh, I'm glad you're already ahead of the game. <laughs> Thank you. Mike. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I just want to commend you on your, your presentation. Um, it was very personal to me as well because um, my father has Parkinson's. And oh, it was right. only, only diagnosed about five years ago. And I, I completely endorse what you're saying about the importance of movement. Um, and uh, he, there, there was, uh, he, he did go along, uh, along with me as well to a, sort of a, a da dancing session. And that was hugely beneficial to him. Brilliant. And it's just really encouraging to see how you're sort of reaching out based here. Uh, and I, I, in fact, I would very much like to bring this to his attention. Oh, but but yeah. in, in the 1980s, uh, Parkinson's came to the na nation's attention, really, because there was a very fa famous actor called uh, Timothy Thomas who had it, and everyone remembered him as this very, very large um, and very, very handsome man. And then in the 1980s, there was an ITN uh, TV program just showing him how he was in, in about the mm -hmm. late 80s, and it just took everyone by surprise because he, he was lacking focus, and he was very much an advanced uh, form. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, I, we must never forget that, even if um, we don't know people who, who do have them. But uh, no, very well done indeed. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Ron. Thank you. Um, Donna, thank you. I, I think we interacted before when Chiswick Together yes, <coughs> was yes. formed, and, and, and that was really good because it was a cross working between lots of different organizations yes. that, uh, but unfortunately COVID and other things took over from that. Um, and I, I'm glad that you are now trying to bring those groups back together again in some way, shape or form. But just for the record, uh, the over 60s um, uh, communities that uh, Hanslow um, do, fun do um, help support, doesn't unfortunately reach as far as Chiswick. I think the nearest center is, at, is in Brentford. Um, mm -hmm. and very mm -hmm. far uh, indeed. So a lot of Chiswick residents um, who are over 60 who would like to have free access to some of the facilities that Hanslow has to offer have to get on a bus all the way down to Brentford mm -hmm. to access that. So for you to, um, to actually work with them, um, that's really, really commendable mm -hmm. um, because they're not really reaching out to us in, in, in Chiswick in, in that sense. Um, like Mike, uh, my parents are elderly as well, but uh, um, yeah, with, and, and they do need this sort of services. Unfortunately, it's very hard to get my foster mum to do anything that uh, requires exercise now. But I did tell her about your videos uh, during lockdown, um, but she, she's still reluctant. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the question I have for you is, and Ranjit, Councillor Gill just mentioned about uh, funding, and as did Councillor Sam Hearn. Um, with Hanslow, with the council, not only is the funds that uh, I'm sure the chair will also expand a bit further on it later. Not only are those funds now being made available to us, but there's also um, uh, currently going through uh, funding is um, the revenue funds that are available between now and the end of November. The thriving, I think it's called the 
the grants for um, thriving communities, and those are to support um, uh, improving health and well-being, and also to support uh, people or, or, or pe people potentially with mental health uh, mm -hmm. issues. And I think you are serving public good in that sense. And the uh, the fund is up to twenty five thousand pounds. Now I know you're putting through quite a few applications. I think that's worth putting that through. And if you are, then the person to be in touch with is our commissioning officer, uh, who her name is. Uh, who's our uh, person in charge of health? Oh, Kelly. Kelly. Kelly O'Neill. Alrighty. Kelly, yeah. Thank so Miss Kelly O'Neill, if you get in touch with her on that regard, and I'm sure us as councillors can offer our supporting um, uh, um, commend commendation towards that. Brilliant, thank you very much. I think that's also a message to the Chiswick Peer Trust to do something for people and their well-being, health, mental health well-being. Yeah. Any questions from people who are here? Any hands going up? No, I think you've answered all of our questions in your brilliant presentation. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed. Um, and isn't it amazing? Thank you. thank you very much. So now we move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the public forum. Your chance to ask us any questions that you might wish to ask. It's up to half an hour. We've had one question already. Um, and I don't know whether, whether the person who's asking might like to ask it himself. Would you like to, Tim? Hello, everybody. My name's Tim Mack, local resident. There is a chance, if all this works, there's two or three pictures, and a picture saves a thousand words, so you'll be glad to hear that'll make me very brief. Um, while they are being loaded, I'm going to try to be as efficient with the time as I can. And I just want to share with you all, as people who are interested and know a lot of other people, one problem, which is that our environment that we share is experiencing a surge in signage. A surge. My interest that I want to share with you is abandoned and irrelevant signage like this one. There's more and more signage going up. I'm not going to address that. I just wanted to address the abandoned and irrelevant. So I'm going to talk about the substance and then the process, which I've been sharing with Councillor Giles. Thank you very much. It's made it much more efficient. But I'm going to start with a good result. As you enter Chiswick from the Chiswick roundabout, this is an abandoned sign. I tried to get traffic to have it removed, with a number of others, because I thought if they had one van, they could pick them all up in one go. Nothing happened. Councillor Giles suggested I tried fix my street, and it's worked. I checked it tonight on my way in, and it's gone, which is fantastic. Well done, Hounslow. Well done, fix my street. So, um, buoyed with enthusiasm, I've identified a few others. If you're able to flick on the side, this one's uh, just outside Chiswick House, junction of Burlington Lane with the A316. It faces the pavement, so it's obviously not a diversion. It's been there for weeks. Next one, please. Um, this is a bit of a controversial one. I may have got this wrong. This is Staveley Road that says road ahead closed. But with the barrier there, the road that it says is closed is actually Lower Park Road round the corner. Next one, please. This is a really bad one. This is a bollard that's made its way across the cycle lane into the road by the bus stop. Next one, please. Oh, thanks. Bollards, more of them. I don't know how these lot got there, but they shouldn't be there. Next one, please. That's all over. <laughs> now, before you all rush out and say, brilliant, I'm going to put that lot on a fix my street because it worked for the first one, I've already done it. And I've done some others, but I need your help. We all need your help. We can't stop the surge in signage, but we can report and report and report. And as I say, one of them uh, has already gone. And so, 
Um, I'm calling this campaign Iris, because Iris is a beautiful flower that enhances our environment, and there's lots of great gardening in Chiswick. But the reason I've called it Iris, and this is where you all come in, is identify and report irrelevant signage. Iris. Uh, so I just wanted to say, we're all in this together, and please join me, and let's do Iris for the next month, and then maybe if I can get another slot here, we could try and get an update on how many of these have gone, but more importantly, how many others. Thank you very much indeed, including Councillor Giles. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Marie. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. I've just walked past in Curtain Close a signage which says men at work. It's been there one month and I can promise you no men have worked there for a month. Well, if at all, if I saw them. So, thank you. Thank you for that because I've already reported three other things in Curtain Close. The yellow tracks from Thames Water. It might be that that's their sign too and that might get them moving on that as well. Thank you. Yes, please. Hello, I'd like to ask a question as to why Hounslow Council are not prepared to rent the town hall for art lessons nowadays. I belong to a group, many of us have spent years coming to its more recreational groups rather than trying to achieve um, a degree or something like that. The best we have been offered is to come down to Meadowbank which is a wonderful centre that they have built. I could only get there in taxis. I'm not able to walk very far. And most of the other people live in this area. Uh, we've made many requests to consider this. We have also been offered Brentford Library, painting and drawing. The problem is they don't have any water at Brentford Library. So they've had to close those courses. So we really feel quite abandoned there are many, many people who are quite desperate because not only is it recreationally enjoyed, mentally and mostly, I would say, more elderly people, they need to escape. One lady has, her husband has dementia. She needs a few hours to break. It isn't just that we want to do pretty paintings. It really is essential to escape from the difficulties of life nowadays. And how's the council feel? No, unless you're young and want to get a degree, we're not worthwhile considering. And really, it's very, very difficult. Um, so I'd like you to consider this matter, please. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do have an answer, partial answer, and not the answer you want to hear, but let me hear from Murray first. Because that's... For Oh, in Oxford Road North. Thank you. To to provide something for older people. I mean, after all, we have all mostly worked all our lives, and in our retirement, just a few hours for relaxation surely cannot be too much. And you're asking people to trek around to places that are very difficult for us to get to. Um, not everything is about the young. Surely mental health and well-being should be considered. I know, you know finances are not easy, but to build a place in Me Meadowbank is just impossible for us. So are these, do you mind if I just pick up on this? Because I had an answer from Tom, Councillor Tom Bruce yesterday, if, if the classes are the ones I'm thinking of, the, with Marissa. Yes, yeah. So I took this up with two cabinet members, um, Tom Bruce, who is adults, health care, I think, and Candice Atherton. Oh, he's children, sorry, Tom Bruce, is still, he's education. That's right, sorry. Um, and Candice is adult care and social care. Um, and I had a very disappointing response from him, which I forwarded to Jan, who I think you must know, um, yesterday, saying that 
because your classes don't advance each time, you might be painting the same paintings. You might just still be doing watercolors as it were. You're not learning a new technique or achieving something towards an aim. They aren't prepared to carry on subsidizing them. So, so clearly that's the education answer. But that's and hang on a second. And what I will do now is go to Candice and make her answer from the point of view of this isn't just about education and advancement, trying to get a qualification. It's, that's what they're saying, because you're not aiming towards a qualification. It's not possible to fund it. I know it's two issues. It's the cost, which has increased the price here, as it were, in the town hall. And it's also, if it can still be funded, can it go somewhere else? So I am, I'm not going to let go. I can assure you I'll carry on taking it up and pushing. So, but that is the very disappointing answer in the meantime. This is an ideal of course. venue. Yeah. And I really feel yes. it should be considered there, there yeah. are well over 20 people yeah. that I know of yeah. who are very, very upset and yeah. disappointed. It was a yes. very important part of their lives. Indeed. I understand yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you. And I think Ron's got something to say as well. Do we know what the cost is for... Yes, what is it, please? Twelve pounds each, I think it's something like that, with a reduced rate. It's not so much. Yes. Yes. But we mm, haven't even been asked if we're prepared to pay more. Most people, if they can afford it, would be prepared to pay more because it's essential. Yeah. Uh, well, it is essential because it is for for your mental health and your well-being, and yes. that's what Absolutely. should be promoted by the council. Not. Yes. It shouldn't be a cost-cutting exercise just because you're not achieving something. You're not going yes. further on, well, but this is for your well-being, and that's what it is. It's, it's like the over 60s. Yeah, well, and I think I know. would argue that the point of education isn't just to learn to a point, and that education is a lifelong thing, and it's about the process of which, rather than learning a new skill every single time. Yeah. It is not mental health. No, I, I'm, I'm completely in agreement with you. People have been locked down. People have been locked in. People that live on their own, and I'm yeah. one of them. It's for the well-being of, and of, it really of us. And it's important to yeah. have something, even whether... It's, it's something to look forward to. You it know. really is. Yeah. And um, I think it should be considered, if we have to pay more, those that cannot afford well, then they will, can be considered. But it's just having a venue... Um, that's Those points have been made, I can assure you, but I think Cathy would like to say something. Yeah, we'll carry on. Uh, we would be very happy to offer our venue if it was of any use to you. Um, I think it was pointed out we're at the end of the E3 bus route. Yeah. And there's step-free access. And there's step-free access. And um, as long as you don't paint too violently all over the walls. <laughs> <laughs> It could be argued they need the walls um, need a bit of a touch up places. Well, they do actually. <laughs> yes, if you, if you've got a Banksy streak in you, we'd welcome you. I know, I, I know it's a little bit further, but bear that in mind. Or anybody else that's looking for a venue, it's the sort of thing we would like to support. As you rightly say, it's to help your well being and 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 health and happiness. So, one, absolutely, okay. get in touch with us then. Yes, of course, we understand, yeah. Yes, yes. 20 or 30 minutes mm. uh, if the traffic's bad mm. down there. And, and it's I think you mean when the traffic's bad, because it's, it's no, no if. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. One, one of the issues is that um, the town hall is now having to raise money differently. It was run by Fusion beforehand, which collapsed, and now it's got a much greater emphasis on making money. So that is something that obviously we're battling with on your behalf. Ron. Yeah, Chair, this is something that um, I'm willing to take on with, with you. Um, I know that the Chiswick Hogarth Youth Centre um, are always open for, they have spaces for throughout the day, and their charge is £25 an hour for one of the big rooms. Um, and I'm sure that there can be um, some ways where we could find funding at the council, um, even if it's just for the year. I'm more than happy to take that up as a case and, and, and get, get the communication going. So hopefully I'll give you my contact details and we can do that. Thank you. We'll carry on trying with the town hall as well. 
Any other questions in the public forum section from anybody? No? Okay, in which case we'll move on then to Chiswick Future. And today we are going to be looking at climate responsibility. And I'm so pleased that we have Isabel Grant with us this evening. And suddenly my notes have disappeared. <laughs> so sorry. Isabel is a, a chartered civil engineer. Um, and has been named by the Telegraph as one of the top 40, no, 40 women engineers. What? <laughs> I can't think. <laughs> um, and she has been a counsellor, so she's here to give us her insights based on that as a person who designs infrastructure and has been a counsellor to give some challenging thoughts about what we should be doing to meet our responsibilities and the great, very great challenges of net zero. Yeah. Oh, it's that one. Okay. I should know. It's really great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Really, what I've got for you this evening is a, just a bit of a provocation. And I'm sure many of the councillors know all this stuff already. But if everyone here has just like one idea um, from what I'm going to say, I think, you know, if we, can, we can all learn something and, and move the agenda of the climate response forward just a little bit. There's, there's loads of talk at the moment about global agreements, the you know, government policies um, to, to get to net zero. But I want to just talk about what can we do at a local level to affect change. So this is about having a positive impact, however small, on carbon dioxide emissions and really crucially, getting a better local environment as well. It's not just about... Um, CO2, um, in which you know is such a global problem, it's sometimes hard to grasp how we can do anything about it. My slides really are just a backdrop. I'm not going to talk to them particularly. Um, just to say a little bit about me, all my slides have have the firm that I work for called Arup on the corner. I'm not standing here as part of that. It just happened. I didn't realise it was on all my slides. Um, but I've worked for them for nearly 30 years as a civil engineer. I'm really sorry you've had mudlarking, you've had dance, you've had watercolour painting, and now you've got engineering. But I hope that you can get something interesting from this because it's, it's such an important topic. Um, and as a civil engineer, I'm really practical. So I don't, I don't take the negative of, you know, we're all doomed. I don't like that attitude towards climate change. As an engineer, I'm into solutions. A big part of how we solve climate emergency is new technology and adaption. And that, that's kind of what I want to focus on, the more positive side of what we can actually do. Uh, sorry, just to say, in my career, um, you know, at Arup, I've been designing buildings and infrastructure for the last nearly 30 years, um, including some fun things like the Aquatic Centre at London 2012 Olympics and some of the uh, other things in the Olympic Park. Um, Crossrail was a, a recent one that isn't quite open yet, but will be soon. Uh, I'm promised that. And um, also a rural primary school in Tanzania. So like re really quite a vari uh, variety of different things that I've worked on. A lot of what we can do about carbon dioxide is around transport. So, less dependence on cars, cleaner buses, trains, but you all know all about that already. You know, I think you've all talked about that in this, in this environment a lot. So I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I can't talk about everything. So I've just chosen one thing to just sort of focus on. Um, and it's around... Housing, and I think this is a bit of a climate blind spot. We don't really think about it as much as the contribution to the climate would merit. So you probably don't know, because most people don't know, that 14% of all emissions in the UK, one four, are down to home heating, just the heating. 40% of the emissions are associated with buildings. So nearly half, 
is associated with buildings. And of that, um, a huge amount is in home, domestic home heating. Um, and so we need to talk about that topic if we're going to solve the kind of net zero challenge. Most of boilers around here are powered by gas. Um, it's a really difficult subject because there are no easy answers. Retrofit, so refitting the energy saving measures of the average home is going to cost £22,000. And that's way beyond the reach of most people. Um, and add to that that the market for alternatives in uh, home heating is not a mature market. So there isn't something you can just go and say, um, can I just, just have uh, a ground source heat pump? Because there aren't that many people buying them. In last year, for example, there were only 36,000 across the whole country installed. There are 27 million homes. So if we installed one every minute between now and 2050, we still wouldn't install enough. So we, it, the challenge is huge. There's insulation of roof space. That's easy. We should all have that already. But walls are big, really leaky of heat, and they're really hard to insulate, especially on older homes such as we have around here. I just want to talk a little bit. I will, I'll come back to a couple of those, those things that are around housing. Um, but we've got two kind of main categories. There's the existing houses. So I've talked a little bit about insulation. But there's also the source of the heat that you put into your homes. To talk about in insulation, what can we do? So I've kind of talked about the problem. What can we do locally? What can we in encourage our councillors to do? And what can we do? And, I and I'd like to emphasise what, what, what can councils do as well. Um, so I think we should target the best kind of homes for insulating. Houses between 1970, built between 1970 and 1990 are the easiest to retrofit. That's where we should start with the insulation. Pre-1919, so Edwardian Victorian homes are the hardest. They really are difficult, um, single brick thick walls and all that. Uh, and putting insulation on the outside is really visually impactful. If you put it on the inside, you lose room space. So it's, it's, it is a real challenge. But we do need to reduce the demand for energy because there's a real, everything that we do provide is going to have to be clean. So we're going to have to reduce that amount because otherwise you're not going to be able to get enough energy. Um, in time, I think councils will need to support the move to hydrogen. Pipe hydrogen into people's homes in the, in the same way that we get gas. But I don't, we're not there yet. Um, but also, this is not a silver bullet because green hydrogen is made from renewables. But it's very energy intensive. So you don't get much hydrogen for the amount of energy that you put in. And what we call blue hydrogen from natural gas is also very, pretty expensive. So th these things are going to put up our energy bills. It, so we do need to reduce the amount of energy that we need in our homes. So whilst attitudes towards climate change have shifted, behaviours, there's research to show that behaviours haven't shifted as much as you know, people say they care. We've got to make it easier for people to do the right thing. To make it more attractive for people to make changes, I, I think another thing that councils can do is to provide training. We need people who can install new technologies. We need to provide the courses that the people who are going to install the technologies can go on. So we can provide a, a, a new generation of technicians. And ground source heat pumps, while not, all, not the answer, they will be part of the mix. Um, and your average plumber can't install a ground source heat pump. So the other, the other part of the um, equation is 
new housing. Uh -oh. There are, there are counties around the country where um, councils are taking the lead. And I met a council leader last week from Wiltshire who's done the numbers on the council houses that he's building. And he says that making them lower carbon adds just 4% to the cost. We need to make sure that our house builders that we're employing to build council houses and private housing are on board. The council can mandate this. We can require our council to do this. And it's shocking that such a high proportion of houses built since 2015 are going to need retrofitting within the next 15 years because we haven't mandated high standards in, in our housing to date. So we need, we, we need to do this. We need to take action at a local level. Just a few other ideas um, about um, low-carbon housing. Other than the big elephant in the room, as I've said about heating, um, we could talk about materials. So engineers like me, we, we get excited about building new stuff uh, and, and, and thinking about how much carbon goes into um, what we build as opposed to what's used during its lifetime, which actually dwarfs what you put into it. But I think it's also quite important to think about what materials we're using. Um, so cement and concrete globally are a massive contributor to CO2. So I think we should look for alternatives. We should make it possible locally for us to build with timber. So timber frames, we need to sort out insurance. Um, we need to give planning more readily to schemes using alternative materials. I don't know what the local plan looks like, but we can add it potentially. I'll, I'll put this out there to you. Can we add it to the local plan? We can play with planning rules. Proper local involvement will favour schemes that enhance the local environment. If you ask people, they will choose the ones that enhance the local environment. And I believe that medium density is the future of our cities. We need not high-rise, you know, super dense, you know, some of the things we're seeing going up in Acton, for example. Um, I think we need mixed neighbourhoods of live and work because that solves some of the transport piece as well. There's less transport involved. So, councils can influence outcomes by mandating utilities and services, including surgeries and schools for the bigger developments and infrastructure first, not as an add-on. Because sometimes, if it's done last, the money runs out. People can see that there's real commitment if the infrastructure goes in first. There's a new initiative doing the rounds in policy circles about street votes, whereby a really local area gets to vote on a development. And sometimes a development can enhance a local area. A, pff, house prices could be part of it. You know, it, it can enhance the local area. And if you give people a vote, they might, they might vote for it and, and, and make it a better scheme as well. Um, and I do think that historically there's been too much focus on numbers. So like the big, big developers have focused on how many units they're providing. And I, I think we need to change the language around that to talk about quality, get rid of that output mentality. Because um, it, it does produce enormous pressure to build the wrong homes in unsuitable locations. So we need to be proactive as a community in thinking through, deciding, and then communicating what kind of developments we want to see in advance so that when the developers come along, we have something to measure them against. And also, we, we shouldn't crowd out. I, I think this is a, a really massive problem, crowding out the smaller developers, because the big ones take all the bigger plots. <laughs> um, and uh, you know what happens if we do this? We can, rebuild, we can rebuild trust in the planning system, because we need to all feel 
that it's working for us. There's something here about district heating. That's another, that's another one that councils can influence in developments. I just heard about one today, big development in Taunton of new homes for sale, because uh, often it's used for council developments. Um, and these are for sale and it's, they've managed to make it work. So um, it, it, it can be part of the mix. I think I'll just finish going back to, oh, I've talked about all that. What we can do better, what we can do different. That's not very useful. I've talked about it all. Um, so I go back to the beginning, which I said, you know, there's, there's global movements and this is very exciting conference at the beginning of November, less than a month, in Glasgow. UK is hosting this UN conference on climate change, COP26. Um, you know, there's, there's always going to be people who, who moan a bit about either it's not going far enough or, you know, we're just going to sign up to things that we're never going to, you know, go, go through with. But I see it as an opportunity for us not to solve, it's not going to solve climate change, but it can re-enthuse us. So there'll be a range of new ideas coming out in the press. We can all learn more and greater knowledge about our own consumption levels. We can all learn something from Glasgow. So whatever the global agreements are, they get signed. They have a part to play. But I would argue that we have as significant or if not greater part to play locally here. You can choose it. Thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you for that. And it would be very nice to go to start off with the right infrastructure, as you say. We're under threat here, particularly in Turnham Green Ward, from huge developments. Holly House on the roundabout, 24 storeys, apparently 889.92 metres high. Um, next door to it, B&Q site is being developed into a four-block mass opposite down power road up bolo lane sainsbury site the post office to come the police station to come it's all happening here and the fear is that everything's going to be very very tall so having this conversation about the infrastructure first putting in the right things before you go up as it were would be very good um questions from councillors first ranjit Thank you. That was interesting and very informative. Um, you mentioned about solar um, heat, heat source pumps, but I mean, I was thinking of installing one of those in my house, but it's so expensive at the moment, yeah. and that's the problem with it. I mean, there was a t uh, television report that um, you have to wait another five years before they actually get cheaper. Um, I can't remember which company was producing them, but you know. Um, so, and also, you, you know, I've got solar, solar panels. Um, again, if you buy a battery, that's going to cost you nearly six to nine thousand pounds to store the extra storage, which is also still expensive. So, for me, um, how can I improve the environment? I have solar panels. I have an electric car, electric charging point at home. I live in a timber house frame. So can you suggest how can I improve further? You're a councillor. <laughs> so you can change policy locally. And I think that's the most powerful, powerful thing. We can, I, I think that we, we all need to take personal responsibility as well because I think it is quite easy to say, oh, the government should do this. Um, but we, I think it's and, and. Yeah. In I terms mean, of this ground source or air source heat pumps, they're about £10,000 at the yeah. moment. But actually, that's not the worst thing about them. They're very disruptive technology. You often have to change a lot of the pipes in your house, depending on when it was built. Yeah. So, you know, there's a huge mess involved. You need the space to put them, either to get the drill in, if it's a ground source, or, you know, a big garden... Yeah. to put it in, or if it's an air source heat pump, you need, a, you know, space to... It's not for everyone. And, and, and I think it's... It's part of it, but I don't think it's as big a part as some people would wish it was. Right. Thank you. OK. Mike. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I mean, quite interesting. Um, I was at the Conservative Party conference uh, to, to, um, for my sins, no, and there was a talk on the, um, uh, or on the quite just this programme on air source heat pumps, um, ground source heat pumps. Um, you know, it, at, I think as Ronald says, it does vary on, on the property. And my girlfriend lives in a flat where there is just one boiler for about 90 flats, and it's constantly on. There's always hot water. It's terrible for the environment. Um, I, um, in my flat, I've just installed a boiler, um, but I'll get the air source heat pump next time, I'm sure. Um, but it's, it's uh, yeah, that was interesting. That was about... That cost about one and a half thousand, so it, it was significantly cheaper mm. than. Actually, sorry, no, it was about eight hundred pounds, but so yeah, significantly cheaper than the air source heat pump. But what came out of the conference was the questions about um, how long will these pumps last? Do they have longevity? That um, I mean, I, new technology, isn't it? So we don't know. So uh, because because um, but the, the boiler I got is expected to last at least seven years, and I would hope that the air source heat pump would. And the other thing that came out was the concern about um, sort of cowboy builders who might offer to install them, but they might do it negligently or so, uh, and there might be something of a, sort of a black market on, of, of um, unscrupulous um, um, uh, individuals who, who might want to... Uh, do it for money and then run away. So, um, yeah, I, I think that there were questions that, that there ought to be um, uh, provisions to, to protect businesses from that. But I just wanted to hear, hear your, your opinion on that. Well, it, it, as you, you're kind of alluding to, the fact that it's not a very mature market, it's not a very big market, and um, it's very much uh, a good thing if you have a super insulated home with underfloor heating everywhere. And I looked into it for my house. It's a leaky old Victorian house. It's not worth putting it in. So it's not, it's not for everyone. Um, it also is not zero carbon because it needs electricity to run it. So purists will say that it's not going to get us to zero, net zero. I think there are transition technologies that get us along quite a long way. Um, so, I, as I say, I think it's part of the mix. Okay. Yeah. Sam. Sorry, I see a lot of hands out there. And I know, yes. I, I've, I've got a lot to say, but I, I'm not going to say it all. Um, my, my clapping earlier on, my father and my grandfather were small builders. Um, the system is rigged against small builders. Um, and, and self-build and cooperative build. Um, and I know Councillor Todd had uh, involvement with a cooperative build, and I think when you have people directly engaged with what's being built, then these kind of questions you, you're raising, these choices, um, the, the pressures are different when it's self-build, cooperative build, or even when it's a small builder who can be building for a specific mm -hmm. client. Um, if it's speculative build, if it's a, a tower block, then you go for what will immediately sell on and what, what will be low cost. But when you're making your own decisions or a group of you are making, a small group of you are making decisions, you're going to end up with sensible answers or more sensible. Sorry, I'll, le I'll lean forward. Sorry, if you had said I'd have leaned forward. I'll, lean, I'll lean forward. Thank you. If you look sideways, we can't hear you. All right. Can I, can I answer that? That question. I think other countries. I was I was emphasising that small builders, cooperative builders, and uh, uh, in individual self-build are really important for this this sector because those people they're direct to the client and they're prepared to be a bit more adventurous often and they will they will make sensible decisions in the way that a large developer or let it be said a local authority won't make. I don't have the answer on this, but I do know that other countries have a thriving self-build you know, uh, industry. They also have many more, they, they can support many more small building companies. And I actually don't know why that is, that we, we have this problem, which also includes land banking. Um, but I think it's something we need to address, and I think councils can do something about. 
Uh, our council has had the opportunity uh, on spare bits of land on council estates, particularly where there have been uh, garages, and uh, they've not risen to the challenge. I have suggested it to the leader, but um, he wasn't interested. It's, it's too complicated, and uh, they, they might do... Uh, anyway, yeah, it's just where it is. Um, timber frame you mentioned, and I think self-builders, small builders are more likely to go for that. Timber frame is now much is getting along. There have been lots of prejudices against timber frame, but it is an awful lot cheaper and the insulation values are very high. So I think that's part of one of the things we all need to think about. It doesn't have to be bricks and mortar. Um, you, can, you can end up with a very excellent property. Um, I, I have, with the help of a builder, built my own. Um, ground, ground source heat pumps, I invested in one of those for a new built property. Um, it was massively under spec and was really a complete disaster. I now have air source heat bump, which is a lot easier to uh, understand and use. And one of the problems with installa insta installation uh, of this kind of equipment is you need a kind of hybrid expertise. You need people who understand plumbing and you need people who understand electricity. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as we know, water and electricity don't really mix. But I I've had so many problems over the last decade with dealing with people who can do half the job and not the other half and finding contractors who can do both and when something goes wrong trying to find somebody who'll come in and uh, pick up a problem that someone else has left very very difficult but it's a problem we're going to have to resolve we um, need to get that message across to the fe colleges yeah. so that they provide the right courses so that needs kind of long, longer medium-term planning the, the other problem in when it comes to social housing, and it, it's not just social housing, but if you've got a new property and you've got underfloor heating, and it's a bit mad to stick it into an old property, I would agree, um, is just, it's a different way of living. You don't, you shouldn't be expecting a radiator that's at 70 degrees where you can dry your underwear. Uh, you can do that, but you're going to pay an awful lot for your electricity to do that. What you're talking about is a a floor, a basic level of heating, which your floor will give you through the winter. And you, you may not be tremendously warm, but you're never going to be really cold. But what you don't do is have your teenage son at the top of the house opening the windows because he's warm, uh, or when you cook fish, opening the back door in the middle of the winter because you're going to lose all your heat. So it's different ways of thinking about living. And in council housing, I believe the example I was given was in Nottinghamshire. They built a pilot project. And uh, people just complained about the huge electricity bills. And the, the people monitoring the site said, well, they're all opening their windows. And uh, it's... Yeah, we've got to make sure that we, we have human solutions. So people want to open their windows. We've got to work... I think yep. we have to work with that. Yeah. Or, or, or live differently, yeah. Uh, you, you've, you said you don't like the negative, we're all doomed. I'm afraid that that's the school of thought I'm with, and I think we, we need to emphasize resilience. Um, sorry, this is just a spare thought out there. We can do all these things, but they're not doing it in China. They're not doing it in other places across the world. So what we do is, is only a small chunk. So part of what we need to do is to look after ourselves, and in this borough in particular, it means stop, uh, stop the places where we've built on where we shouldn't have built on being flooded and that's that's not far away and uh, all these other ideas are good and yes we should do them but we need to think very hard about the risks that are coming down the line at us the infrastructure needs to be there um, as I said I could go on and on but I'm uh, I shouldn't be given that time um, Should we give Gabriella a go? Very, very, very quickly. Final, final point. I did make some quick bullet points, Joe. If you, if you bear with me, uh, this particular group of councillors uh, are actually very clear that what Hounslow does needs to be environment, very much more positive with the environment. Hounslow has produced its own action plan. It did do a lot of workshopping on it. We're not impressed by the progress. And in true kind of socialist fashion, they produced a 10-year plan. And, and frankly, ten, ten, a 10-year ten horizon on this is ridiculous. Um, yes, we've had COVID, but we need to be front-loading what we're doing. 
Um, we need to be really getting on with things. What we should have been doing up to now is doing some pilot projects, learning, because as we've heard, the, the experience and the knowledge isn't there and the, the contractors are not there. We should have been doing the pilots. But I think we're going to have to move forward pretty rapidly. And, and Hounslow, Hounslow does have the ambition, I believe, with the different parties. But um, certainly this, the councillors who you see in front of you do believe that there's a hell of a lot more we could be doing than we are doing. Thank you, Sam. Gabriella? Yeah. Um, Isabel, thank you so much for this. Actually, you've reinforced a lot of what I've already been um, thinking of, kind of things like the cost to retrofitting housing in the UK is going to cost us £250 billion. If we were to decarbonize or retrofit every house um, we would every house in the UK it would be 600,000 houses a year and we only actually have 900 fitters in our current uh, training stock. So looking at things like the cost of your average boiler um, installer or gas engineer is 54, the average age of your construction worker is 55. We have a real kind of skills gap there, which I think you've alluded to earlier, and I think there's a lot of stuff going to come through. Um, we've also got the new, ho new heating homes, no, new, the new heating in homes strategy that is going to be due very, very soon, which I think will help us look at how we look at energy um, and, and because clean energy and warm homes go hand in glove. Uh, but knowing that there's no path to net zero that doesn't pass through the homes of the poor and looking at some of the costs that we've dealt with earlier, um, what do you think of things that we as councillors should be pressing more for, especially for those who are going to be struggling with energy, um, energy needs over the winter that comes ahead? I think you've got to start with the easy wins. Some of them have been done. But I think we have to tackle, we have to set out how we want new council houses to be. That is within our control. We can't go on building homes that are going to have to be retrofitted really soon. That's something within our control. Um, and then I think the easier things, it's not easy, but we need to start by properly insulating homes that are easier to insulate, as I said. You know, you can identify which ones those are. That's where I'd start. Thank you. Can I come to Rod and John later, because a couple of people have been bursting to contribute during this discussion. Can I do that? Thanks. So, Murray. I'll come to you, John. It's just that there's some hands that are going up as we're speaking. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Murray Rabawant. I'm a local resident and also chairman of the West Chiswick and Gunnersbury Society. Just as an aside, I have just spent the last, I don't know, 10 days possibly, commenting for the um, examination in public of the reviews of our local plan and some of the issues that you've raised are very important issues. And I, I do agree that housing is very important in terms of climate change. Um, although you mentioned the Victorian housing, I, I well understand is some of the most difficult. But on the other hand, if you've got a Victorian terrace, you've got a degree of insulation because you haven't got many outside walls. So perhaps that is something because certainly flats in Victorian terraces, the idea of where you're going to put uh, an air source or a ground source heat pump, it's just, and similarly if there are flats, that, you know, putting solar panels on the roof, how do you then share the, you know, the, the benefits? But th those are certain points aside, but I think it's very important too that we stop demolishing buildings because the embedded carbon in them um, is such a waste of all that material and all the carbon. And, you know, I see proposals for knocking down buildings that are less than 40 years old, and that's crazy. We should be able to reuse them. Um, so those are some of the issues. But just going back on a much more sort of general policy level, 
councils are very constrained. I mean, it would be nice if as a council we could do X, Y, and Z. But as I'm sure you know, when it comes to planning, councils are very much constrained. Particularly in London, we have the NPPF at national level. We have a London plan, which was just adopted earlier this year. And then we have the local plan. And the local plan has to fit with all those other hierarchies. Um, and so a lot of what you're saying has to be done at national level because we can't go against the MPPF. So in terms you were saying uh, about we'd all like medium rather than high rise, I spent weeks of my life at a planning inquiry on the 32-story building they want to put very close to here. So the point is that it, it, it is the government that is setting these targets and it really is, never mind the quality, feel the width. As long as you can tick off numbers, that's all that counts. So let's get lots of studios, one bedroom apartments in high rise blocks uh, and not build the family homes. So I could go on at length, but I just, you have to see it in context. You've got to persuade the government and certainly the government's white paper that, put, that it put out about planning was to remove any of the small chances as a community we have to interact. It was a developer's charter, and I really hope it's going away. It's not the way to go. There may be faults with the current planning system. It's grown up like topsy, but it, the basic principles behind it are correct. Um, what I also did want to say, and it was mentioned, uh, I think, by, by Sam Hearn, um, the council has got, it declared a climate emergency. It has got a whole range, it's got an action plan. You mentioned COP26 on November the 4th, I think it is, there's a whole special day the council is running for the community about COP26. Um, it has a greener borough framework and running that partly is a, a greener borough, um, I'm not sure what they call themselves, but I'm not sure, but whether you know, but one of your colleagues at Arup Probably. is actually on that. It's at the Green, Green Recovery Board, uh, a Steve Turner from Arup. So I think, you know, we're all trying to get involved. Um, and there is a lot we can do as individuals. And I certainly believe, although we rely on government for the big things, if each of us as an individual does our bit, it does all add up. Um, I tried to do my, my little bit, and I'm sure many people here do. Yeah, so the Green Recovery Board is actually kind of aligned with the Green Recovery Fund that was issued as part of the government, um, kind of, when did they issue it? June. Uh, some of their outcomes as a result of the, and um, it all forms part of the green recovery and looking at green skills and actions like that. So while um, there is stuff been going on locally, it is part of that national picture as well. So I think it's worthwhile kind of playing back, uh, kind of linking that back in. Um, and you're quite right, like, there's a responsibility at every level of government to make sure we're making decisions. But what we've heard is, um, well, I don't want to say that really, but um, is that we can't, you know, we've all got to work together on this. I think that's where it comes down to. I don't think we get anywhere by playing a blame game. Um, and, and we're all equally responsible to doing, for doing... I'm sorry, but it's... I wasn't playing a blame game. No, 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 I'm not trying to accuse you of it. I'm just saying I'm that ju we're I'm, all equally I'm capable. all for keeping party politics out of things that are as important as planning because they affect all our Absolutely. lives. And I think we should all work together um, as individuals, as communities, with the council. Um, it, it's just that it was really an opportunity to make other people aware. There's so much information on the council website about X, Y, and Z, but if you want to know what's happening in terms of the greener borough, then there is a whole section under environment uh, about the greener borough, um, and you know people can look there and, and see to what extent they can get involved. They could become an environmental champion, for example. Exactly. Environmental champions are a great way to get involved in the local community. There's only about 150 of those that have been recruited over the last two years. So there's still plenty of opportunity for people to get involved locally. And you can do that on the council website. Thank you. Mary, would you just mind saying who you are? Because I'm not sure everybody knows that you run a local group. Sorry. Sorry. 
uh, since we live in a, the part of Chiswick right next to what is an opportunity area and the opportunity area you know these are things that the are in the London plan these are areas where the sky's the limit and you don't have to abide by the normal density rules and the opportunity area comes down to the Chiswick roundabout and in fact it includes the Gunnersbury station area as well because we all want to do something about Gunnersbury station but nobody has any money to do it so it's likely they will want to build some vast quantity of residential don't ask me where on top of the station um, in order to try and pay for its improvements but uh, anyway yeah thank you thanks Ruth you're next and then we'll take Ron and John and Peter last Thank you very much. Um, it just is worth out pointing out to people, come, call it, following on from Sam's comment and from um, Mari, Hounslow is going to COP26, which not everyone will know, with the UK Cities Climate Investment Commission, which was set up by Niall Bolger, whose job title I don't exactly know, but I'm sure these people do. Um, he's on the advisory board of London councils and core cities, which was set up to leverage finance and drive investment into low and net zero carbon projects across the UK cities. They've also got grants for upskilling uh, Hounslow Council and they're waiting for the money so that they can get young people into green jobs and to learn these engineering jobs that are so important as you pointed out. They have secured amongst other things 19 uh, billion, uh, million for in external funding for all sorts of uh, projects within the borough. So there is an awful lot going on and um, they are creating a Green Skills Academy, but they're waiting for the funding. So although they secured it a year and a half ago, it hasn't come on stream. So like Murray, it's nothing about polit politicking, and I don't think there should be any accusations that our council aren't really working as hard as they can to, for the benefit of all of us. Thank you. Thank you then, uh, Ron, John, Peter, and then David. I think it's, um, it's, to me, it's, it is politicking uh, because the, we talk about council funding. Just remember where that council funding is coming from and it is coming from central government um, and no matter how, where you position it, it is coming, they are getting the funding from council government. Now, my second point, my, from central government, from central government. Just, just acknowledge that. That's just acknowledge that. Is our money from Hang central on a second. government? Can, okay, my second, can, sorry, Chair, my second point. Um, every council is going to COP26. It's not just Hansler. Every council that I know is going to COP26. There has representatives that are going to COP26. So let's remember that. Um, and by the way, COP26 is being run by Alex Sharma, our government minister. Right. So let's just remember that for one second. But my point is more to, um, to the presentation that you put forward. And I, and I really think that as a group and as, as a community here, it's something that I think we should take forward and start a real campaign. I know we've had the, ICE, the IRIS campaign with Tim Mack. Okay, I think we should start this campaign of targeting homes from between 1970 and 1990. Those are homes where um, my colleague, uh, I believe, lives in, in uh, such a place. Um, these are places where we could start uh, with retrofitting and, and we can look at the costing of what that would mean and how the council could apply that so that we can get the ball rolling. Because the target is 2035, is that right, um, Gabriella? Uh, 2030 and 20 uh, Ron, we're already, I'm already working on that. Fine, fine, so. fine. Uh, it doesn't, that doesn't matter too much. Uh, the fact that, um, that they, they've set this target and yet they have had no uh, strategies has to implement it I'm glad that um, G Councillor Giles is already on the case, but it should be those in administration who should be leading this charge, not those in opposition. So we're already doing things in opposition that we should be doing, um, that we will be doing after 2022 in May. But I want to ask you about that and how we can make this a real campaign into 2022. I'm, I'm trying to guess here, because I come from over the border in Ealing. I don't know who anyone is, and I don't know what part I'm trying to... I'm going, Who's the Green Party? Who's the socialist worker? Um, I actually don't know who anyone... So the, the, for me, if there was a political point made, I, you know, I, it was by accident. 
Um, and I think it, I, it's just a real call to action for us all to be more ambitious um, and in, you know, at the smallest level and then to the highest level. Um, so it, it, that, that's really where I was coming from. Thank you. John. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just want to make a minor point. Um, I've got to declare an interest. I'm on the planning committee, uh, Ms. Speaker. Sorry, I haven't got your name. Yeah. Uh, I think you painted rather a bleak picture about new houses, so I just want to put it in balance if I could. Uh, you're shrugging your shoulders as a, as a defence mechanism. OK, I'll ignore that. Um, yeah. The London plan sets out certain criteria for a carbon limit. Uh, and this borough um, sets a limit of no property with less than 35%. I'm going to use a, a wrong term, carbon effectiveness. So it pays a, a hundred pound a tonne above that as a levy. At the moment, that fund has got 1.7 million of unused funds. To be fair to the council, and I, am, I feel I've got to say that, there are some properties coming through both social and private where they are 94% efficient as the carbon and heating. Now, what that does, and I think you made a point more effectively later on, that virt gas is virtually prohibited, and you end up, and everyone says it, electricity is very, very expensive. So you have that balance. Uh, but I think, to be fair, um, I've personally been very impressed with the quality of build, and to get to achieve that with the resultant benefit on fittings, fixtures, and things like that. So I'm just trying to put that in balance. Yeah. That's I, I'm very um, open to you know finding out what's happening in, in Hounslow. I don't know. What I do know is that as a country, we've built a lot of homes that we're going to have to retrofit really, really soon. And I just you know I think that is that's where I'm coming from. There's something called passive house which requires no energy to heat it at all. That should you know that's 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 our goal. That's the, the, the that's the dream. And, and let's keep going towards that. Thank you, Isabel. Um, Peter. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, my name's uh, Peter Edwards. A, a question um, for Isabel and for our councillors as well. Um, I think before a council can set about making its own um, building stock and uh, its own land as environmentally friendly as possible, it must know everything about um, which building stock it has and which land it has. Um, and um, I, my own experience with Hounslow Council has not been, is not been that they've been great at that. And a government minister was saying a couple of days ago that councils in general are not great at knowing what they own and where it is. Um, so I was wondering, um, Isabel, is that something that you've had experience with uh, um, in your career and what's it been like dealing with um, people who don't necessarily know exactly what they own? Um, and to the councillors as well, what's your experience of dealing with the council in terms of whether they are getting basics like that um, right? Thank you. Peter, you've got a really brilliant point. If you think any council's no good, try working with Network Rail because they haven't got a clue. Um, I think this, this problem speaks to a new area of data management, which we can do much, much better at. Um, and you know, I, th I think that's, that's part of what we need, good, good data. Thank you. Gabriella? Um, so I, I, I don't want to steal Joe's thunder about asset registers that we were talking about over the weekend, because um, that's what we do on our days off. Um, but, but certainly, uh, in my experience, I was doing some research on the public service decarbonisation scheme where money has come from central government to help schools decarbonise. And um, just even getting a list of which schools haven't yet taken up that offer um, took an, a, a, you know, a very, very long time. Um, it took about three months to get that answer, and I thought it was pretty straightforward. Um, and, and for me, uh, one other factor that we haven't necessarily talked about, and I think that's the difference that we're talking about with new homes versus um, kind of other forms of, in, of energy usage, is um, 
carbon insetting above carbon offsetting. Um, so, you know, the whole idea of the, carb of the new building, new builds and basically minimising the carbon at construction rather than looking to offset it somewhere else, I think has to be a real, um, a real way for us to go forward, which um, schemes like the public services, de public, is it public schools, PSDS, so I think it's either public schools or public services, but I think it's public school, no, because it's, anyway, the PSDS, um, it took a long time to get the answer for, and um, we haven't covered everything that we need to as yet within that list. Thank you. Just before you run, um, we just need to do something technical in case we run over time at 9.30. We need to suspend standing orders. Proposer? Seconder. Thank you very much. I've forgotten you, David. Sorry. Ron, Ron's just... Just very briefly, um, thank you, Peter, for that question and Isabel for the reply as well. Um, <clears throat> it just so happens that uh, I think had, had the council... Um, done its due diligence in, in um, doing an inventory and preparedness for uh, what sites they own, what land they own, they could have been eligible for um, uh, funding, which was actually released today, £57 million, pounds, um, which has gone to 52, 53 councils uh, to fund um, for 5,600 5, homes on sites such as disused car parks, derelict buildings, as part of the uh, £78 million Brownfield Land Release Fund. So we didn't uh, qualify for that because I think we haven't got the infantry to know what we own um, fully. So I think we, we've missed out on funding, as uh, Ruth perhaps is trying to, uh, uh, to check. But if the councils are not prepared, if we haven't got the right leadership in place, these sort of things go past um, un, 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 unaware. And I think that's what we need next year. Next, next year we need a, a council that can actually look at funding. This is we sorry, need a sorry that can we just look, keep a that, keep that can quiet, actually look at these things in thank, in thank you Ruth that can actually look fully at these details thank you Ron David's been waiting for a long long time to ask a question there you are. Um, I'd like to address the elephant in the room and the elephant I think is this there are roughly 650 MPs my daughter is a scientist said that roughly 45 had serious uh, engineering or scientific qualifications. Many is that? Two. Well, not enough. I suspect it's true in the um, top of the civil service as well. The policies that I see rolled out, and, uh, and I'm not a scientist or an engineer at national level, are poorly thought out, poorly implemented, poorly costed, and poorly understood. There have been numerous disasters on things like um, insulation. So if the top is rotten, it makes it very difficult for everyone at this level to operate. So what are you all going to do about it? Well, that, that, I'm, not, I'm, not here, I'm not here as a, a pitch for, for election, but yeah, yeah, never mind, you let me. I, th I think, yeah, so my, my, my answer to you was there's very, very few engineers. So that's like the practical, how do we use science? I think there are two or three engineers in Parliament. That, as you say, there are, there are probably more with a science background. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I think one of the things is, this is my pitch for engineering. It's so exciting that people are busy getting on with it rather than going into politics, but there we go. Yeah. They don't have the background or the skills. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Um, John, next. Yeah, can I answer the question, put Ron, and uh, going around in circles? I'm pleased to tell you I found a house that uh, Hounslow Council didn't realise they owned. It had been occupied for 20 years. And another one in Bath Road, Chiswick, had been empty for seven years. So I think you can form your own conclusion there. Some very lucky tenants in very expensive houses. 
And all this makes me think of Ballymore in Brentford, which the council didn't have the courage to ask the developers to retrofit, well, hadn't even started building it, but to change their spec from gas heating to electric. So that's the climate that we've got locally. People at the top here also aren't doing the right thing. So, um, Joe, just to answer that final point, like, as a failed engineer myself, um, it's a very tough profession to go into. Um, but the thing is, the rate of technology and um, advances in technology is just phenomenal. And so things like electric boilers that we haven't really spoken about today is another potential future technology coming down the road. Um, I spent a lot of time in Aberdeen, and I have seen the ambitions that city is now having to become the world's first hydrogen city. That is a city that has taken the downfall in oil price and the loss of talent as out of the industry and has pivoted into this opportunity to become a cleaner and greener city that had basically created its wealth off hydrocarbons. And so for me, looking at cities like that and speaking to some of my former colleagues in that industry, it is really phenomenal to see how we can take the best practice from cities where they do have engineers and the, the energy, um, or the, the chap who's, in, who's responsible for the energy and the whole hydro, um, hydrogen agenda in, uh, in Aberdeen is a former BP engineer who, who lost his role because of the, price in, uh, the drop in the price of oil and the huge redundancies that were being made between 2014 and 2018. And so that, to me, is a great example of where we can take the intellect, capability, innovation, and skill of a region that, um, and replicate it across the country, which we could hopefully do here as well. Thank you. Murray, and then I think we should stop. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to agree with some of those points that, that Gabriella made, particularly about offsetting. But I think the real problem we have is the lag phase from when a development is given planning permission and things are moving so rapidly. So we've got developments, big developments, that, that are now under construction or about to start construction. But permission was given three or four years ago. So we're, it's built into them that they are the wrong kind, you know, they have the wrong kind of energy. But the other issue on that is, um, and you know, you can't knock developers' heads together. Um, we have a very good example, very close to here, where there are two sites. There's what we call the Chiswick Curve site by the roundabout and the B&Q site behind it. We have asked, or planners have asked, our MP has asked, why do you not put those two sites together? And then you might make sense of the, the whole space and you could have a heating system that applied across, but they're two separate developers, they're two private things, and they're not going to merge or work together, and so the planners are forced to deal with the application they have before them. So yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you on that, and um, Mike will tell you how I was lobbying him last week on not approving certain planning <laughs> developments this week because of their lack of future thinking, um, and I, I think that's something that we... we definitely need to be doing is saying no if it's not going to fit in with the objectives of the council to be carbon neutral by 2030 because we have to think about well if that's the target how are we going to achieve it and how can the council actually be true to what their ambitions are if they're approving stuff that goes contradictory yeah, to these overarching goals this was very much an issue I raised at the public inquiry on the L&Q Citroen site. That was one, if you recall, the council refused. Um, but then the GLA took it over. Anyway, it went to appeal. And, and I said, you know, what are we doing? What is the Secretary of State or the, the Mayor of London, the whole caboodle, what are they doing? approving something which you know is is energy demanding and using the wrong kind of system but as i said never mind the quality feel the width it, it was providing 400 units of whatever quality and in the planning balance that was the benefit that overrode any other consideration and that's the issue with quotas fundamentally i, I would argue uh, it should be about quality and what's needed rather than quantity 
But I think when they're planning it, they, they should put a clause that if technology has moved forward, they should be allowed to change the way things need to be developed so that they, you know, a, new, a new building should adapt to what's currently available rather than when it was approved. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Gabriella, as she said earlier, is our environment spokesman. Has anybody else got any questions? Well, Isabel, have you got anything to add to any of those points? Do you wish? I, I, there's so many interesting ideas. I just, I just hope that we all take something from this. And I think it's really brave to have this discussion, um, uh, you know, open forum. And uh, I salute you for doing that. I wish I lived here. <laughs> <laughs> Sam has got to say. Just a very quick thing for you to look at when you walk home, if you're going through a residential area. A lot of people all across the borough concreted over or asphalted over or paved over their front drives. Uh, small gardens disappeared. What they're meant to do is put them back using what's called SUD, Sustainable Urban Drainage Systems. And I know from canvassing all across this borough that very few people do that. The council are meant to enforce that. That means when it rains, and this is a borough li liable to flooding in great many areas, the water goes straight off those driveways, into the drains, into the roads, straight out to Mogden Sewage Works. Mogden Sewage Works fills up several times a year and it just overflows into the River Thames. So have a, have a look at a few of those driveways and uh, you, you may, it may not be immediately apparent, but um, you can tell whether they're suds compatible or not. I think and that's, another, if you're that's doing another talk. Sorry? Yeah, that's another talk. Okay. I can give it now. <laughs> does, the, does the council have a SUDS policy? I think that, that's, that's a really, um, you know, is the council putting in... It, it has a policy, SUDS. it doesn't enforce it. Because there's, there's some wonderful examples of smaller towns in Wales, I can't remember exactly where, where they've put in swales in urban areas, for example, in streets, and integrated the drainage into streetscapes. And it's just, you know, so it reduces flooding. It's an engineering scheme, but it's really beautiful as well. And uh, so I think that's another, that's another whole topic where we can be much more ambitious. Thank you very much. Thank you, well. Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm? Yes, I know, yes. So we've just got some tidying up to do. That's the end of the forum, as it were. Thank you very much to everybody who has given us such an amazingly interesting evening. We just have to tie up a couple of things with um, signing the minutes and just one item on the agenda, which is if anybody has any urgent business to raise. Councillors. Nope. Okay, that's it then. Thank you. Just the, the date, other thing is the date of the next meeting, which is the 18th of January, so a big gap between then and now, during which I hope you're all going to spend your £20 vouchers very well indeed locally. <laughs> oh, we have to agree the minutes. Sorry. Are the minutes agreed? Any notes on any? No. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. It's been a great evening. Thank you.